would like to invite the first speaker up. Abdisalan Noor is the team lead for surveillance at WHO's Global Malaria Program. He is also the, the lead of the World Malaria Report and will be speaking to us about uh, the global burden of malaria, its trends, the methods, and challenges and data that go into that. Uh, thank you, Philip, um, and thanks, Gina, for inviting me to uh, the Alan McGill Symposium. Um, today, I'll talk to you about the methods the WHO uses to estimate the numbers of malaria cases and deaths in the World Malaria Report, which is released every year. This is a signature document for the Global Malaria Program and the, uh, the larger World Health Organization, and not because I'm the one who's leading it, I've only been responsible for last year's World Malaria Report and this year's, but because it actually is the singular platform to track national, regional, and global progress we, against um, the, fight, um, for the fight against malaria. Um, today, I, in my presentation, I would first of all like to perhaps impress upon you how uh, critical this document is to shaping the global policy uh, the global malaria policy, how um, also help you recognize that um, this uh, currently it contains the best uh, official estimates at national, regional, and global levels, and uh, take you through the um, methods that we use to estimate the burden of disease, but also recognizing that there are important limitations and um, present to you a suggested way forward in terms of improving on, on the methods and, and subsequently the numbers that come out of these methods. There are, uh, you would have seen um, the data presented in last year's World Malaria Report. We're just finalizing this year's World Malaria Report in which um, we will be reporting trends up to 2017. Um, last year's report um, showed that progress had stalled, both in the uh, morbidity of malaria and also in malaria mortality. The subsequent uh, results shaped uh, the discussion around uh, the, uh, the, the, the path for the future in terms of global malaria policy and what we need to do to get back on track for the, uh, the uh, global technical strategy. Um, this has had important implications across the partnership and uh, the, the regions and also some of the debate that's ongoing in the highest burning countries that are contributing to uh, the, the uh, globally as being off track uh, for the GTS targets. Um, so that is all about I'm going to say about the, the, the importance of this document. In terms of the methods, we use um, three methods to estimate the burden of mobility and three methods to estimate the burden of mortality. The, before I go into the methods, I'll just like to recap when we say the burden of malaria, many people have different um, ideas of it, and it's got multiple metrics. Um, what I show here on this chart is essentially uh, the different uh, things one looks at from infection all the way to death. What the Global uh, Malaria Program report focuses on is direct malaria deaths and direct malaria cases. And just to say that across the estimation process, while we know that the, uh, the, uh, the magnitude of uh, the burden is higher at level of infection and reduces all the way to death, the uncertainty in the estimation of these metrics increases um, uh, from the measurement of death, which is extremely controversial, all the way to the simple measurement of infection in an individual's bloodstream. Now, the methods to estimate malaria morbidity. There are three main ones. The first one, which applies to about uh, 23 countries, is just the use of the actual data. These are countries which have uh, extremely low malaria burden and overall contribute to just about 0.5% of the global malaria burden. Then there's a subset of countries, about uh, 49 of them, most of them outside of Africa, but a few countries in Southern Africa, which also have low malaria burden, uh, reasonably good surveillance systems, but have gaps in the surveillance system with respect to 
um, uh, the public sector, which reports mainly to the WHO, not capturing all the events, as well as um, uh, an incomplete diagnosis rate, and in some instances, an incomplete reporting rate. But the bulk of the estimates come from one single model, which is the conversion of parasite prevalence uh, to incidence. And I'll focus in the next couple of slides on first the adjustment of the routine data. There are three main things that concern us in the adjustment of the routine data. One is the, the testing rate, what's the proportion of individuals who are tested. The second is the reporting rate, what proportion of reports are received by um, um, uh, the country and the NMCP from the health facilities. And perhaps the most important, which has the biggest impact on the estimates, is the treatment seeking. So what proportion of cases are likely to be captured in the public sector? This is just a diagram to show you the different uh, corrections we make to the routine data. But what I would like to dwell on is really the impact of uh, treatment seeking. The information we use to adjust the routine data for treatment seeking comes primarily from household surveys. And it's focused primarily on the treatment seeking among children under the age of five years who had had um, fever in the last uh, two weeks. And the, the surveys normally capture the different pathways to uh, treatment and by and large divided into those who have sought treatment uh, from the public sector, the private sector, however you define it, from the informal retail sector and those who have not taken any action at the time of survey. And so once we get the routine data which comes primarily from the public sector, then we assume an equal distribution of risk among the other groups, those who sought uh, treatment in the private sector, in other sectors, and those who do not take action, and apply that correction. But there are a number of uh, problems associated with this uh, up, um, adjustment. One is we do not know how useful self-reported fever is as a proxy of malaria fever treatment. We do not know whether fever treatment among children under the age of five years is, is a good proxy for what happens in older children and adults. We do not know whether the probability of having an infection is similar across those who individuals who seek treatment in the public sector compared to those who don't seek treatment or who seek treatment in other sectors. And to understand the downstream impact on uh, uh, mortality, we need to know whether these individuals have been treated with effective treatment, and that is a major gap. Now, with all this uncertainty, we still apply this correction. In terms of the parasite rate to incidence model, the entry point is estimating parasite prevalence through a model-based geostatistical model. The person who leads that work is Pitt, who would be one of the last speaker of this session, uh, who is uh, the leading the Malaria Atlas project. And once we have estimated parasite prevalence, we apply epidemiological models to convert the parasite prevalence to incidence using a model that quantifies the relationship across different age groups and transmission patterns um, between transmission and case incidence and the outcome is the expected number of fevers attributable to malaria at different ecologies across different age groups. Now, there are a number of important limitations in the process. The first one is parasite prevalence come from household surveys. There is an important temporal latency every three, four years, or five years. Some countries, once every 10 years. The Times when you don't have data, and in areas where you don't have data, the, the biggest um, drivers of the prediction is the determinants such as climate intervention and others which have a significant influence. And importantly, it's creating a situation where countries are gradually not believing in the estimates, largely because what the model is estimating in some countries is discordant, or what's coming from the routine system. In the conversion of parasite prevalence to incidence, there are also other important problems, such as the active surveillance data we're using is relatively old, there has been a significant shift in transmission and also a significant shift in the age-related immunity. And we do not have a good handle on the effect of access to effective treatment on, 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 on the burden of, of, of disease and subsequent um, mortality. Um, in terms of, so if you look at the way forward for those countries in Africa where we largely rely on the parasite prevalence to incidence model, the question is, is it time to adjust to the use of routine data? And I'm one of those who believe that in many of these settings, it is time to adjust to and fall back on the routine data. As it improves largely because there has been significant improvement in diagnostics and significant improvement in reporting. Just to illustrate this, since 2005, we've had one billion tests among patients of all ages 
in Sub-Saharan Africa. This data in most countries is available monthly. It's got a lot of biases, but nonetheless available. At the, in the same time, about two million tests in children under the age of five years in household surveys, done every three to five years. So there's a significant difference in terms of the volume of data that's coming up to you and the temporal resolution and to an extent the spatial resolution of this data. Now, just to illustrate the differences between if we were to start using the routine data and if we relied on the parasite to incidence data, this is an example of Nigeria, which the parasite trait to incidence model estimates about 48 million cases in 2017. The routine data reports about 12 million cases who are confirmed positive. When you adjust for reporting rate and testing rates, the adjustment gives you about 26 million. One is just cases in the public sector, the other one is population-wide estimate of the incidence of disease. There is a fundamental difference in terms of the outputs in the sense that the parasite data incidence model estimates malaria attributable fevers. The public sector reports essentially individuals who are fever suspected to, may ha to have malaria and who have been tested and returned a positive test. That aside, we know from the household surveys that the use of the public sector in Nigeria is about 25%, which means if we assumed homogeneity of risk of infection in people who use other sectors who don't seek treatment, we might be uh, essentially missing out on a large number of cases. The adjusted routine uh, data population-wide might uh, suggest up to 80 million uh, cases of malaria in Nigeria. Now, this is not to say that the, the routine data is better than the parasite threat to incidence model or vice versa, but to show you that two methods that are approved by the WHO and used by the WHO could give you significantly divergent estimates uh, depending on the context. The same applies to some of the high burden countries. Now, when it comes to mortality, again, we use uh, three methods. One is the, uh, basically the actual data reported from the countries. Another one is adjustment of the routine data. And uh, the largest bulk of the, of, the, of the estimates come from an all-cause uh, 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 adjustment for the cause of death fraction, largely based on VAT bubble autopsy estimates of the malaria attributable deaths. Now, the problem with the uh, routine data where, when it comes to adjusting for mortality is we have the problems that affect the quantification of estimates of incidence because we apply case fatality rate to that in, in, in the countries where we use the routine data. We use a static case fatality rate which comes from really old uh, data sets and some of them not representatives of the context where we are making these adjustments. In terms of the, uh, the, the data coming from the adjustment of the bubble autopsy cause of death fractions, which contributes nearly 90% of the uh, case counts for deaths we report in the World Malaria Report. These are largely based on a bubble autopsy system that assumes there's a, there's a cause of death assigned to that particular uh, uh, death, which then uses a number of covariates to uh, quantify through an envelope the proportion of cases that might be attributable to malaria, which globally now stands at 5%. To adjust that with any of the new data requires a large process of bargaining. It becomes a marketplace of, of deaths, really, for the diseases. And changing the attribution from 5% for malaria globally to anything like 6% means you have to take percentage deaths from other diseases, which is a really complex process. Now, it has a number of limitations, both related to the covariates that are used and the corrections for over five and this, the, the, the inherent problems of using verbal autopsies. And this is just an example of some of the data we use for correction for over five, which is really bad and extremely old. Um, and this comes to uh, when I talk about some of the ways forward in terms of how to improve the estimates. But before I go to potential processes to improve the estimates, this is just an example of the relationship of parasite prevalence, which is the main covariate in the course of death fraction and the course of death fraction in, in terms of trends. If the trends were equivalent, you would expect a ratio of one. But you can see by country a significant divergence from the uh, dashed line, largely because year on year there's a significant smoothing in the process of quantifying cause of death, which affects the relationship of cause of death fraction with PFPR and subsequently the malaria attributable deaths that come out of this model. To address some of these problems, the WHO convened uh, an evidence review group in March this year. Um, the report, the detailed report can be found on that URL. 
Uh, but to end my presentation, there were six key recommendations, which is improving the existing parasite prevalence models, improving the way they used to convert parasite prevalence to incidence, increasingly using the routine data and getting a good handle on the biases in the routine data, beginning to track other metrics of burden of malaria to contextualize both cases and dates, but also primarily because they're important, such as anemia and severe disease. And for anemia, we're going to report it for the first time in many years in this year's World Malaria Report improving the assumptions in the way we estimate mortality, but also in terms of research, beginning to think about comparative studies that compare the clinical incidence and prevalence across sets, different settings and try to quantify the, the effect of the different pathways for treatment seeking. Thank you very much.